As we begin our study of the book of Numbers, looking at the fathering skills of God, let's go immediately to Numbers chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. Mark that time phrase. First day of the second month of the second year. He said, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name, one by one. One of the most important responsibilities of a father is to reveal to their children the resources they have and ultimately to help a child see more resources than they normally would see. In this case, Israel knew that they were a lot of people. They didn't know how many was a lot. So just to give some definition to the size of the different tribes and the size of the clans, just to clearly spell out for them who they were, God ordered a census. Now let's be very, very clear. God didn't need the census. He didn't need it at all. Israel needed the census. Israel needed to know how many people they had and what that looked like for the assignments that God was going to give them. But this is one of the central qualities of a slave is that they have resources available to them that they don't see. They have resources available to them that they don't know how to use. I remember my extreme frustration with apprentices who did not know the tools that I had on my truck, didn't know what the tools did, and didn't know the parts that I had on my truck. So from time to time, I would leave an apprentice on a job saying, do this. And I knew that I left them all the resources needed that they could do that in half an hour. I would go to the store to get something. When I came back, they had made a real mess of the job, hadn't finished. And I said, well, what were you doing? I said, well, this and this. Wait, 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 wait. There's a tool right there that does this in two minutes. You've been half an hour, you still haven't done it. They didn't know the tools. They didn't know the resources they had. Therefore, they either did a job badly or they didn't do it at all. We have this in the office over and over and over and over again. It's part of the normal parenting process of my team. I give them an assignment, go do thus and so. They come back and say, yes, but we don't have the resources. We've hit this particular problem. We can't here. We can't there. It is amazing how difficult it is to stop me. Once in a while, they genuinely have a problem that I can't do an end run around. But most of the time, I can find a way. I can find a resource. I can see something that they're looking at that they don't see. We had this situation two days ago. We were supposed to record. We were in a timing crunch, variety of reasons, schedule doesn't matter, but we had taken all of our recording equipment up to Vantage, Washington. Tony was recording material there for the video. In the packing, we were running behind because the 20 minute interview between Arthur and Brian grew into 45 or 50 minutes because both of us are motor mouths and that really wasn't a good combination for an interview. And we were in a hurry. So it's all hands on deck and we're tearing down all the equipment, packing it, getting ready to head to the airport. We've got a plane to meet. Well, I've got this box full of stuff related to one of the main lights and I can't figure out how to get this part in the box, so I unscrew the handle because it doesn't fit. I get the other part to fit. I seal up the box. I don't know what I did with the handle. I thought that I took the handle, put it over here in the carrying case we called Big Bertha, but they called me when I'm on the road saying, we can't find the handle. I said, look here, look there. They looked everywhere. They couldn't find the handle. We still can't find the handle. And because we can't find the handle, we can't lock the light in place, and therefore we can't videotape. I came, the missionary kid from the jungle who knows how to find resources, and I said, where do you want the light? We positioned the light. They showed me where they wanted. I looked at it clearly, absolutely. Without the handle, we can't tighten down a particular bracket. But I'm a father, not a slave. It took me four seconds to solve the problem. 
I walked into the warehouse, I got a push broom, I brought it in here, I turned it upside down, I put the broom side up, and the light that is shining so elegantly on my face right now is supported by a push broom, but you wouldn't know that if I hadn't told you, and the light doesn't care whether it's supported by a very techy little handle in back or by a very ugly push broom in front. That's what I do. I find resources, and a father can see resources. A father looks at this five-year-old and says, you have the ability to learn how to read. You've got resources in your mind that you don't know about. I'm going to send you to school to put more resources in you to unpack the resources that are there. Kid has no idea that he has the ability to learn how to read, but father does. So a father has to reveal, first of all, what the resources are, and as a child moves from sonship to slavery, the father has to reveal what resources are available. One of the most common phrases here in this office coming from me is, this is not an original problem. Somebody else has had this problem. Thousands of other people have had this problem. The solution is already out there. Why don't you look here, here, and here to find out how other people solve the problem so we don't have to reinvent the wheel or we're not stopped because of the inability to solve the problem with the resources we have. It is a key, key part of fathering. People call me with monotonous regularity saying that they have a problem and they're stumped and the only resource that they can find is my time. And most of the time, there's an abundance of resources out there they've not availed themselves of. The one that I get most frequently is, I've listened to one of your CDs and you're obviously a man that speaks my language, will you mentor me? And I'm thinking, I'll consider it after you spend another 150 hours listening to the resources that are already out there and you read a thousand or so pages that are on the library. I mean, I don't know any other ministry that provides as much free material. We're getting ready to put another 50 hours of audio free downloads on our website in addition to the articles, in addition to the daily blessings and people insist that the only resource that will work for them is my time when they have not even tapped into the available resources. It is a spirit of slavery. And our American culture is devastatingly in bondage to money. Any problem, you think, can be solved with money. I grew up in a non-economic culture. And we solve problems with tangible resources. We looked around, we looked to find out who had, who knew, who could help. And there was more of a spirit of sonship in the poverty of the illiterate farmers along the Amazon River than I find in the white middle class culture here in America. Let me give it to you a different way. You look at a drug dealer, a pusher, or a dealer at a higher level than the street level, and these people are problem solvers. They have very limited access to legitimate resources. And to run their business, these are entrepreneurs. You need to get past the illegality and realize that we have this whole tribe of entrepreneurs that are effective problem solvers. They can't advertise on the web. They can't advertise on the billboards. They have to go strictly through word of mouth. They can't set up a bricks and mortar location. They have to be continually on the move. They have an inordinate number of problems to solve, and they solve them. They, there is a far greater level of creativity in this particular spectrum of a spirit of sonship among drug dealers and pushers than there is in the average pampered white middle class person, particularly the baby boomers and their children who solve everything by hiring a professional to solve their problem. Now, I'm not saying that pushers have a spirit of sonship. There are several other areas where they fall really short of sonship. But I'm saying in this area, in this area of seeing the resources, they're very, very ingenious, very creative, very impressive. So part of a father's job, the first step, the very first thing that God told Moses to do after 
a year and two months to move this slavish tribe towards sonship was let's find out what resources are here. And so I do that day one. When people come in to apply for a job, before they even have a job, most of my time is spent finding out what their resources are. They come in for the interview, they start telling me their skill sets, and after a few minutes I ignore their skill sets and begin talking about the intangible things. Do they have emotion anointing? Do they have fine motor skills? Do they have um, uh, teamwork ability? What kind of problem-solving ability do they have? How do they get along with the person above them, alongside of them? Uh, what did they enjoy in childhood? What did they want to be when they grew up? And I ask all of these questions because I want to discover the resources they don't know they have. What they come offering me is they know how to do Word and Excel, they've got some IT background, and they have some bookkeeping background. And those skills are nice. I need to know those things. But there's so much more about them that they don't know. And my job is to find out. One interview I did just a week or two ago um, after I had grilled and grilled and grilled this gal, I said, OK, um, I'll quit tormenting you now. And she says, oh, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm learning all sorts of things about me. This is excellent. Um, because that's what a father does. I helped her find out what it was that she had within her, who she was, where she would fit, because that's what fathers do. And because she was not fully up to speed in terms of spirit of sonship, she hugely missed the majority of the resources that she had. She came with a very skimpy resume. She'd done a dab of this, a dab of that, just starting out in the workplace, no real excellence anywhere, no long work history, several years at one company, and she was kind of embarrassed by your resume. I gave her resume about 15 seconds look over, and I said, no, there's more to her. And as a father, I helped her discover the resources that are in her. Now, my objective, my passion objective, my obsession, to be a little more precise, is to be transformational, not to be informational. I have no particular desire to put more gigs of information between your ears. I am not interested in making you a master of God's technique from the book of Numbers. I'm interested in moving you from slavery into sonship and moving you from sonship into being a father. So I'd invite you to do two exercises. One exercise is to make a list of who you are. When you get stalled, put it away, come back at it tomorrow and add some more things. Don't stop until you have a list of at least 100 resources that you have. Now, a resource could be something you know or it could be someone you know. One of my resources that probably is not very marketable is I know how to paddle a dugout canoe. I know how to hold a canoe absolutely stationary in the water without hardly even making a ripple. I have no idea how that could be a resource for the kingdom of God, but I know it is a skill set that I've learned from spending years and years on the water in dugout canoes with a paddle in my hand. So make a list of every experience you've had, every skill set you've had. Did you hike to the bottom of the Grand Canyon? Well, that's something I haven't done. That's something you know. That's an asset of some form that God may eventually use that someday to help somebody else. I had a simple situation like that in Europe recently. I was talking to a very intellectual man, a brilliant man, a, a man with a, a big world view about Europe, about the European Union. And I made the passing comment that I knew what the social DNA of Romania was. He was massively impressed with the fact that I knew that, when in reality I knew that because I have a friend who's a missionary in Romania. She figured it out. She told me. I remembered it. But God pulled that out of the file to build a bond with this other man. So make a list. Whether you can see how it's marketable or not, I never could have imagined that God would use that piece of trivia to build a bond with this man, but he did. So make a list of at least 100, preferably two or 300 things that you know, things that you are, potential that you have, areas that you've unpacked relationships you have, geography that you know. 
and then see if you can find three or four of your friends that you could impose upon and let's give them a more modest assignment ask them to make a list of your 10 top strengths no other instructions don't define spirit soul body economically leave it wonderfully vague to see what they say your 10 top strengths so compile that list do for yourself what God told Israel to do for themselves which is find out and after you have spent some time figuring out who you are I'd like to invite you to for the next month make it a practice every single day to reveal to somebody else something about them that they don't see it's an art form it's an art form that needs to be developed it's an art form that I've practiced so many years that sitting across from a stranger on a train in Europe when I can't even speak their language I can see some things about their behavior about their personality that tells me ah oh, there's a treasure there well that's an interesting little facet of his life but I have reached that place through practice through discipline and you can too so I would encourage you to set yourself a measurable quota have a friend hold you accountable that once a day somewhere somehow you are going to identify a strength in somebody else preferably one that they don't see but if it's one they do know it doesn't hurt for you to articulate it to affirm it to validate it to learn the language to gracefully in our culture across gender if necessary comment on a strength that another individual has and to affirm it so for your part practice moving out of slavery into sonship by getting a much bigger picture of who you are and then in terms of other people practice expressing to them as a father what treasures you see in their life that they might possibly not be aware of it will be exciting to see how much growth takes place if you do these two exercises will it take time and effort absolutely and if you can't be bothered well that's another mark of slavery but if you want to move out of slavery then cut something out of your life take the inconvenience take the time the discipline push through this and do what God made Israel do very first thing the first step was to do an inventory isn't it interesting that the first step that Almighty God took with Adam when he was fathering him say Adam let's do an inventory I've given you all these animals to serve you so let's go see what I've given you the first step in fathering somebody who needs to be fathering is to walk with them and help them see the resources that they have. Go do it.